Digitel is one of the leading companies for live streaming events, running corporate virtual events, or managed webinars. If you're looking to reach worldwide markets or generate revenue from adding a virtual component to your meetings and conferences, leverage Digitel's 33 years of experience in creating flawless online events. For more information, go to digitellinc.com or email them at contactus at digitel.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are again, another podcast. And today we are talking about ballrooms with two people who have significant experience on the front lines of their design and use for events. You and I sat down with Alan Kurtz, who's managing director of Gotham Hall and the newly opened Ziegfeld Ballroom here in New York, and architect Richard Block, who oversaw the Ziegfeld transformation. Block's firm specializes in hospitality and restaurant projects, as and he also headed the, the renovation of the Plaza Hotel's Grand Ballroom, as well as all 28,000 square feet of the hotel's event spaces and catering kitchens. These are people who have thought long and hard about what a modern ballroom should be, the amenities they have to have and how best to move people through a space. Great. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the idea that we're bringing in the architect partners. Uh, and I keep making this clear throughout this podcast that it's so critical that those people are really the originators of what a room should look like and what the new the new public squares, I call them the, the, these new marketplaces for ideas that are really ballrooms or, or, or event spaces, really, because the word ballroom we've learned from this podcast, it's kind of nobody really uses ballrooms anymore as ballrooms. Well, I think you you there there definitely is a meeting that needs a ballroom, yeah, yes, yes. but um, but it is so much more than that, yes. And you know, we'll hear that there's a lot more going on in ballroom design than people may realize, yep, yep. Uh, and that there are inherent design challenges. You know, we're going to talk about what makes a space stand out from other ballrooms, how venue managers determine uh, how a ballroom finds its sweet spot in terms of size. I found this really interesting, uh, and a bunch of other things. So let's take a listen. The ballroom is a mis it, it's not a misnomer, but it isn't truly a ballroom as in the sense of ballroom in the 20s and 30s and 40s. People, it, people are not going there just to dance. It's, uh, it's an event space. And you could have automobiles, you could have elephants, you could do Aida in there. Uh, it, it's that kind of a, a, a multimedia, multi-event space and that's a modern ballroom but what is the what is a ballroom though i mean in the old days what did it was the center of an activity was it really about dancing do you have any history of ballrooms uh i I, i'm I'm far from the expert on that but i i can talk about uh what what our ballroom needs to do or what the plaza needed to do and that's a, a although they don't call it multimedia that's that's a that's a 30 year old term perhaps uh and i've done multimedia rooms too but today it's 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 a multi-event space that could uh that you can have a a large variety of people uh objects cars elephants as i said Uh, almost uh, nearly anything can happen in there including banquets and banquets are an important part of that so what are the elements of a ballroom like if you're going to design a ballroom where do you start what was that first conversation with you and alan okay well i i I would uh, double back i'd go all the way back to the beginning uh when we talked about ziegfeld uh, ziegfeld began to suggest a, a style and a character so we knew immediately that uh that we wanted to do something that was out of the late 20s, early 30s, and that was by and large uh, a, a kind of art deco experience. And we also knew that uh, Siegfeld Theater had uh, an old reputation, and uh, but people really didn't understand it. They walked into a really a 1968 uh, plain vanilla box space, and they thought it was Ziegfeld. Uh, so what we needed to do was to establish some idea of what the place would feel like and a sense of, of the character first. And that was, uh, in a sense, we wanted to create a space that uh, that was Ziegfeld, 20s and 30s. It was everything people thought the old movie theater was but was not. And in fact, the, the real theater, Ziegfeld, 
as Alan said, was it was torn down to make room for a 44-story tower. And that was the last of anything remotely related to the 20s and 30s. So to start with, we wanted to have a character and a, a sense of place that was tied back uh, historically to to the 20s and 30s and to the Ziegfeld, which were uh, theater uh, that had uh, that that gave people a, a kind of a legacy experience in that sense. Then we had to talk about how do we make the thing work, and that was uh, that's that's a little tougher. Uh, the when you say work, what does work? Mean? In other words, uh, in other words, you can have events in this place. You can have two hundred events, all different, and set them up uh, day after day, morning, from, uh, night follows morning. Uh, they can be utterly different. You could have an 860-seat dinner in the evening, and the next afternoon you could have uh, an automobile show. So what did you have to do to the space to, to achieve that? Okay. The, the most important part was uh, we needed to come up with a design that did two things, that sort of squared the circle. Uh, if you want an event space that works for all things, you need a very neutral space. You need a space that... that uh, planners, designers, party designers, uh, event planners, they can, cre they can create the character they need for their event. On the other hand, you need a space that is, when empty, uh, appeals to people wanting to do all of those things. So it has to have a character. So you're stuck between, do you have no character or do you have some character? And so it's a kind of dialectic conversation you have with yourself and we had among ourselves uh, it's trying to find the sweet spot. What, the what, sweet how, spot. what was that conversation like between you two on that? I mean, the white box <laughs> versus let's uh, deck it out. I mean, what was Alan smiling? Uh, you can't see his body language, but he's obviously uh, has an opinion on this. I do have an opinion on this. Richard's right that we did go back and forth because I needed somebody to walk in, whether it was a bar mitzvah mom or whether it was a planner from IBM to walk in and go, wow, this place is beautiful. I don't need to do anything. On the flip side of it, when you have an event planner walk in the door and goes, holy cow, I can make this place be purple and orange because that's what the bat mitzvah girl wants to do, it also worked. There's a, there's a very fine balance in there. You don't want to be, no offense, you don't want to be the Hilton Ballroom because that's sort of boring and non-generic. We didn't want to be that. We wanted to have its own character, yet be able to be transformed when wanted to be transformed. So if for people that are planning uh, ballrooms and event spaces around the world, how did that conversation, what is in the middle? Is it the tones of the color? I mean, what are the things that, that make it that? If you I think that's specific to the to the first uh, uh, question, which was the character. The first thing: w what kind of ballroom are we doing? We're doing the Ziegfeld Ballroom. That's a 1920s, 30s, a legacy. It comes with a legacy and a history, and so that was the source of of that was the beginning. That was point zero. That was uh, where you began the conversation. What were you doing with uh, with Plaza? With the Plaza, it was utterly different. Uh, that was a uh, the plaza is a kind of vaguely, uh, I want to say, 19th century French uh, pistache of uh, over-the-top kind of stuff. And it was largely, also was a landmark space. So uh, we had, so we did about, about half of it was landmark and half of it was brand new. And there was a very, that was a very easy task because I said, all right, the rest of it has to look like the landmark part. And so that was an easy design really truly easy this was not the ziegfeld was far more challenging and frankly more interesting for the architect so alan what about you went you've done the tavern of the green ballrooms you've yeah. done gotham hall when you approached you were there at the beginning of gotham hall it was a bank correct and how did you decide to you're like the transformer well the bank actually was also sort of like the plaza it was it, it, the gotham halls landmarked so there was not a lot we could do internally other than changing carpetings and picking because there was no carpet there actually originally and sort of doing some color schemes that that sort of paid homage to the 1920s style you know historic 70 foot ceiling bank um the Ziegfeld was very different than that because we really took a red velour room and made it 
beautiful. Uh, and some people thought the theater was beautiful in that red velour. But we didn't think that was appropriate for today's modern style. And did you talk to event planners as you went through this process? Did you get their feedback either before, middle, I hope not after, I'm sure you've heard afterwards. But, oh yeah, uh, everyone but, has opinions, right? Soliciting, like <laughs> how, how they want to use the space and what, what amenities or functions they want to be able to get out of it. I, oh, absolutely. I, we, I had separate separate meetings. We had talked about doing a round table and I decided not to put everybody in the same room together because uh, I did, wanted their individual opinions and not for them to be influenced by each other. Uh, but I spoke to, I think about 10 different designers and event planners that had very specific opinions on colors and style. What, was some of the, what were some of the themes that came out of that? Hopefully it translated into what you did. Yeah, well, it was very interesting. There were certain people that said, "You're what's where in this ballroom is that Ziegfeld feeling?" And I said, "What do you mean by that?" Well, I sort of I said it was a movie theater, it's a big screen. We actually did LED walls as opposed to movie screen to take the technology to the to the next level, and we looked at it. We did circular staircases coming out of the hydraulic stage to sort of have that feeling of that old theatrical stage. Again, because people were a little bit under the misconception, everybody's mind when they think of the Ziegfeld, they don't think of the 1960s, as Richard said, movie theater. They think of the 1930s legitimate theater. And that's what their mindset went to. So a lot of people were like, hold on, you, you need to sort of have that character in there. And I think we accomplished that. And so that's aesthetic or a character type thing. Were there functional things that went into this or that, that derived from those conversations? Absolutely. There were, that's for sure. I mean, I actually, I've been doing this a long time. I think I'm of 35 years. So I just wanted reconfirmation. I, I don't want it to come off sounding self, too self-assured, but I wanted reconfirmation that what the direction we were going in was touching all of the points that people were going to want. And I think we accomplished that. We did an entire stealing gr steel grid um, in the ceiling for ha multiple hanging points. It's infinite amount um, hanging points. Every designer walked in and said, I can hang anything from anywhere. Yes, well, th that's for them is, is a w was a wonderful thing. And we did that because of, we really tried, we looked at it and we came up with this homage, actually it was Richard's idea, we wanted to come up with this homage and believe it or not, it was a 1930s luxury cruise liner called the SS Normandy. And that was our inspiration for the ballroom dining area. And we nailed it. Actually, I was having uh, Danny Meyer had, was it a guest at NYC and Company's gala dinner? And he came up later and said, wow, this really reminds me of a luxury cruise liner. <laughs> and I was like, I, and I'm like, uh, you know, I don't give you enough credit for being as bright as you are because holy cow, you nailed it right on the nose. We actually exchanged a few emails back and forth about that. And I'm like, wow, you nailed it. We use the SS Normandy as our, as our inspiration for the dining room. But the, going back to the, the, tr the points for hanging, that is a deficiency in a lot of places, right? I mean, it seems like that's one of the older older uh, bell rooms don't a have that. Absolutely, especially in landmark buildings, you, you can't add rigging points because you can't do that to a landmark building. So we have an, literally an infinite amount of rigging points right now. Well, that was one of the deficiencies at the plaza, and that's where I learned about that, that uh, there were limited opportunities to hang things. So we were starting from scratch. Essentially, we had an empty box. We gutted everything that was there. We flattened the floor. We ripped out the walls. We added two big elevators. We moved uh, staircases. We had to do all kinds of uh, uh, muscular types of structural uh, and changes to accommodate uh, 1,300 people. Uh, the building, the 1968 building, was built. This is very technical. That's okay. We're this is we're this is the only place that people care about that stuff. Oh really? <laughs> yes. Marvelous. Okay. Well, uh, it was built under the old code. That was a 1938 code. That was the first large code the city had. It had ordinances before that, and 
and the building was hastily run through the building department so that they missed the 1968 so-called new code. Uh, and they had 1,300 people on a public assembly. They, they were allowed that. Under the, uh, you can't do that any longer. They won't allow you to go back to uh, a 1938 code, even if your building was built under that. Uh, they insist you go back to the 1968 code with a bunch of exceptions, so we won't get into that. But in order to meet the 1968 code, that was a more rigorous standard. So it required a lot of, uh, it required a large effort to figure out how can we keep and retain those 1,300, and we did. In fact, we ended up with more seats. So what's another functional thing that had to, that, that's a part of this ballroom now? Um, that our that our planners out there are going to be like, yeah, yep, we need that. You have it. I think we have. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to focus on one thing. Uh, the lighting. There are two kinds of lighting in a, an event hall. There's the house lights, the the architectural lights. You go in and out, the, the lobby, uh, things of that sort. Uh, work lights. You have to clean up. You have to do certain practical things. And then there there's the event lighting. The event lighting is uh, has lighting experts and uh, an army of people that give you all that beautiful purples and oranges and reds and following spots and do all of the drama. But we have a house light system that uh, is flexible and can be manipulated. It's a really high-tech system that allows for uh, a less costly uh, uh, event where you can actually use the house lights to give lots of character to your uh, event. Uh, we have a system that uh, we control the hundreds of light bulbs we have here one at a time. We can change their color, we can make them bright, we can make them dim. Uh, there's an immense flexibility in that lighting system. So a lot of thought went into that. And, and how, does, how does that work for um, people who are uh, buying lighting from you guys. Are you charging for lighting design or is that part of the deal? We actually have a, there's a company called uh, IS Pro and, and they're in house. They have all the technical people who've been trained on this lighting system where, but it's not only the lighting system. Richard's really talking about the lighting that's above the chandeliers right. and some of the built in lighting. That's, you still need theatrical lighting. Yeah. You don't have to do theatrical right, lighting, right. but you still need some theatrical lighting where you're doing stage washes and you're utilizing the video walls and you have programmers there and you're doing moving lights. There's still right. a lot of things as far as theatrical lighting is concerned in the space. But on the flip side, what Richard's saying is if you want to walk into the room and just say, light the chandeliers, I want them to be pink. You can do it modestly. You can do it modestly. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, what about uh, in terms of the technical stuff? The pre w w talk about pre function versus the event space. There's a whole every time I go to something, there's a debate. Oh, our pre function is too small or it's too big or whatever. How do you d think about that? Well, we have two. We have two major public spaces, actually three. One of them is the ballroom, which is about nine thousand square feet, and the other is the mezz what we call the mezzanine. Well, it's it is a mezzanine, and it's about 4,000 square feet, and that's a gross area. And, of course, we have a small lobby, and we have a small, a relatively small entrance, which was uh, basically a decision that's related to wanting to have the maximum amount of event space. Uh, but if you want to do pre-function, so we can do pre-function uh, in a, a number of ways, and probably Alan will, will want to go further with this, but we could do it up on the mezzanine, and we designed it so that you can flow up to the mezzanine with using an elevator or the stairs, uh, which most people do use, uh, comfortably up to the mezzanine first without entering the ballroom, and then you can come back down to the ballroom two ways. One is the way you came, the other is uh, through a stair that, that is directly flows into the ballroom. Is it better from a design point of view to, for people that are event organizers or event planners to bring people in and out different places? Is that something that's, that, that you plan in or is that, does that matter? Uh, you, sort of, you sort of take like what reveal. you're given and you make it work no matter where you are. Right. And we designed it where we knew we needed stairs on both ends of the mezzanine because if you have 500 people upstairs in the mezzanine, 
you're going to want them to flow from both sides into the room. You don't want them all coming in one door. And that's how, that's how that was thought out. There's a, the, the ballroom itself is, is large, and we flattened the floor out. Obviously, we had a movie theater that had a change in height of six feet from the front to the back, and we just flattened that whole thing out so that there's this huge surface, and uh, it's not all, always needed uh, for the, some events. So uh, Alan's team has devised, using those rigging points we spoke about, uh, drop curtains that allows the main ballroom to be split into two parts, well, a I mean, pre-function and Flexibility function. is the number one goal, right, Alan? 100%. I mean, we actually the, the created... lesson. Yeah, we created a <laughs> flexibility. Nothing's built in. Everything's movable, um, except for the staging on, on one end. But we did this drape system that's on a rolling system. So we actually have these drape walls that divide the ballroom so we can increase cocktail reception space, the pre-function, or decrease it. We can make the ballroom smaller, really based on everybody's needs. It, it, flexibility is absolutely that's the key. One the, that's 100%. one of the hundred percent. That's one of the key things. As well as back of house space. So, you know, Richard, you mentioned wanting to maximize what can be used for events, but I'm sure there's a tug of war with back of house. What is in your back of house? What did you have to have? What was? We obviously have a system? full kitchen. You could run a, a restaurant out of our kitchen that we, that we built in. That that's not. We knew we needed a great kitchen. We put in state of the art ovens and walk-in boxes that we did but we knew going in that we were going to sacrifice back of the house space to have front of the house space thankfully we have gotham hall literally under one mile just down sixth avenue is our service entrance at gotham hall and we have trucks running back and forth our warehouse is at gotham hall i have a sixteen thousand square foot warehouse at gotham hall in the lower level so we knew we were doing this consciously, that we were going to not do this gigantic re renovation with a, a lot of money going in and saying, oh, let's make a ballroom that holds 450 people so we have proper back of the house space. Uh, that doesn't really work. We decided we were going to do a ballroom that we could seat eight, 900 guests for dinner with staging and presentations, and we'll figure out the back of the house space by running trucks up and back between Gotham Hall for all our chair storage, our table storage, et cetera. Is that and a sweet working. spot? Is that a sweet spot uh, for the um, industry, 800 people? Or like there's some talk that we need some bigger ballrooms here in town, which are coming, I believe. But where is the, the need uh, that you satisfied and what is the need that is not satisfied if you're asking me would I have liked it larger of course really? I, you know is that the need in New York it is it's not that there's this there is a sweet spot because when you have the dinner that's four to five hundred guests they walk into a space that holds eight to nine hundred guests and they go oh this is too big for us right so you have that balance but on the flip side of it, there are absolutely dinners that used to be at the Waldorf Astoria that were seated all in the balconies and they were 1,100, 1,200 people. There really isn't a proper space in Manhattan conveniently located. You can go to a pier somewhere on the far west side or the far lower east side and go to you know different piers and spend a lot of money making it look nice. But there's really an armory as an example, but there aren't really a lot of places unusual compare that to las vegas where you can just go to any hotel ballroom and sit three thousand people for dinner without even blinking an eye right uh you don't have that in manhattan yes you have the five big hotels in the city and if you don't want to be in a hotel you're scrambling do you think that the demand is there though absolutely so this is like somebody that's a little crazy on the real estate side <laughs> will have to like develop something because it's going to be very expensive. There are things being developed on the far west side yeah. now. Javits, I think, is doing Yeah, something. Javits is doing a large, large event space. Yeah. Uh, there's absolutely a need. I mean, it's not just that one dinner that's 3,000 people, but on the, it, there's more than that because I think that some people potentially don't even come to New York tourism-wise. They out-of-town convention for the dentists, whatever it is, because they need a ballroom that seats 5,000 people right. for dinner, and there is no place here yeah, that does yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as, as the, uh, I believe that event spaces are the new town squares in the world. 
and that there's a responsibility to be a place where people can collaborate. Have you been able to design things in that make it so more people can talk to each other? And is there certain things, is it the sound, like the sound, for example? How, uh oh, here we're, we're, I think we hit on something. How do you make it so you can hear Every each other? Every wall is padded. I mean, we, Richard will talk about that, but we, we was took that pain. Your insistence? No, yeah. Well, look, yeah, it was because <laughs> we wanted it to be perfect. First off, going back to the Ziegfeld name, People knew that theater as acoustically wonderful. And that was so important to keep that for the people who used to walk into the Ziegfeld and said, wow, this place was awesome sound wise and it's still awesome sound wise. That was very, very important. And without getting too geeky, how did you do that? Well, we, we, we designed the ballroom itself, uh, uh, for floor to ceiling, the, all the walls are padded. The two east and west walls, which are the long walls, uh, they're padded, and that's how you get uh, uh, vib uh, reverberations off uh, uh, in a long rectangular box. So we solved that one quickly. Uh, there's carpet on the floor, which is good. And the ceilings are, well, the ceilings are all sound-absorbing materials. Uh, when you look up, you just see this sort of Parcheesi-like pattern of d design pattern up there. But actually, they're floating clouds, and sound goes past that up into a kind of attic space, unused attic space that's filled with sound-reducing materials. Uh, the clouds themselves also have uh, uh, acoustic materials built into it. So everywhere we turn to, we, 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 wherever we could, we were careful to include a lot of acoustic materials. Is it fair to say that this is probably the most acoustically sound ballroom in America? At this point, you're the latest, one of the latest, one of the latest um, technologies. Quite I assume. an opening you're giving them, David. Well, I think that, but the yes, thing is, though, no, you're, how if, if you're not doing that, and Alan is a nutcase yes. around sound and uh, making sure you can hear, because that where all our hearing is going as we get older. I mean, that to me is a well, good I have thing. A, I, I have a, 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 a acoustics are a particular. Uh, I design restaurants by and large for right. the most part. I've done hundreds. Uh, and uh, acoustics in restaurants are, for me, a big deal. Uh, and uh, I, I, I mean, there's some wonderful, great chefs we have here in New York, and the, their restaurants I won't go to because I can't. Oh, I, I, I feel the I same can't exact talk to way. A friend. Exactly. We don't go to restaurants to, to to stuff your face, to eat and get out. We go to restaurants for entertainment. Tell some of these younger friends. people. That like we're well, all nodding here, by the way. <laughs> well, there are younger people that feel the same way I we totally do. Totally agree. No. Um, let me let me uh, let story. me get, let's give one piece of advice on. So we talked about acoustics. A lot of places you walk in, it's an old loft. What does an event organizer do to mitigate that if he didn't have the zig field? What is, he, what is the first thing that you would recommend as an architect to mitigate sound issues? Well, if you want to mitigate sound issues, there are a couple of really simple principles. One is you need sound absorbing materials. Two, you need mass, uh, things that don't rattle, uh, like sheetrock, tin, glass, they're, they're not good. Uh, they create uh, reverberations, uh, echoes, things of that so sort. So when you say sound absorbing, is there a place to get that? this? I mean, Alan, you well, deal with this. Is there, like, where does an event organizer go to get this stuff? He uses curtains. curtains. uses fabrics. So curtains are, the, are like the, the, the Theat thing. Theatrical draping, you know, okay. that 25 ounce or more. I could tell you the okay. weight. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, so we're going we're gonna to get come to a close here, but I want to ask both of you, like if you had to do it over again, what would you change in in the next version of a Zigfield? Because you're each one of your places are, is a piece of art. So what what do you, what would you do next if you had to do it all over again? In your next project, is there something that that you want to that you saw? Well, I want to make this part better. I'm going to make you think for a second. I'll let Alan go first. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the tough question, right? What would I do to make the Ziegfeld any, better? Any bowler, you're an art. Your your business is creating event spaces. You've done it several times. I have. Like, what does the next version of an Alan event space have that you wish that you always could do? Is there something that people ask for that you can't deliver? No there's, budget. There's budget two, is no issue. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> I felt like the Ziegfeld wasn't a budget wasn't an issue either. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wish it was, but it wasn't. The There are two things. It's sort of interesting. I think a great small space would be wonderful to add to our locations because we turn so much away 
that we're too large for. On the flip side of it, there are large things that we're not large enough to handle. So if you were to say, do you want a beautiful small space or a beautiful large space is the next thing. I would take a beautiful large space over a beautiful small space because I like large That's guest your, counts. Oh, I get to hear something coming here. Not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. But I would tell you that that the Ziegfeld really did touch on a lot of points for a lot of people. Location was great. Having the name, and, and I don't mean this disrespectfully towards anyone, but if you put the Waldorf Astoria on your invitation, it means something, and that's no longer there. And if you put XYZ Hotel instead, it doesn't have the same cachet as the Waldorf Astoria name. And, that, and I would tell you that the Ziegfeld name, we didn't invent it, we just we're just yeah, carrying the not? torch yeah, yeah, we're just not? carrying the torch that that's important to have to have that going forward and i would say that if, if there's another project down the road i think it has to be iconic it has to be a, a a project that fits that same gotham hall was a bank built in 1924 with 70 foot ceilings the ziegfeld name is iconic I, I think it needs to carry that forward and i would say that would be the next project right. down the ro road if my wife doesn't divorce me <laughs> <laughs> yeah building a birthing a ballroom is <laughs> tough i i, I I think I would just uh, uh, agree with with Alan that they're all individual projects. So to say what uh, I'm sure that there were things that I'd like to do better. You always learn from yeah. every job you do, uh, but for the most part, uh, these are uh, uh, very personal projects. These right. are projects that uh, that respond to an impulse, uh, uh, and I think that Alan's point that it needs an idea. It's the idea isn't oh eventual. That's not an idea. That's right. a thing. Right. Right. So I, I I would say that that's what would happen. That we would uh, we would uh, discover something with an idea, and then realize it. Great. And before we close, wanted to give you a chance to let our listeners know where to find you. Um, how well, we know the location of the Ziegfeld, of course, but uh, how do they reach you to learn about events and uh, more about what you do? Uh, Richard Block Architect. Uh, I can be Google, Googled. I'm not going to leave a telephone number. You don't need that. But I'm, 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 I'm all over. You can find me anywhere. Before Alan goes, I want to mention one thing. The reason that we have an architect on is because we believe, I believe that architects and the event industry are not appreciated enough. And the design, you know, you always hear, they didn't talk to the people or whatever. The idea is that having this as a team, having the architect, they're so important to the event process from the beginning stages that we want people that are experts in restaurants and event spaces to be part of our community in a bigger way. Can I actually expand on that a little yes. bit? Sort of interesting in how I came to Richard Block and et cetera. Gotham Hall has always flown under that radar screen just a little bit, and I've always liked that. And Richard, for all the major projects that he's done, including the plaza, et cetera, sort of fit that bill for me, flying just under the radar screen so you could have a conversation with him and say, by the way, I'm going to be loading a car into this building. How the heck are we going to do that? Oh, by the way, we're going to be bringing in motorcycles, car, it doesn't matter what right. it is. The one day it's gonna be theater style seating for 1200 people, the next day it's a seated dinner. It needs to be practical, yet it needs to be functional and beautiful. And Richard and I, I think, collaborated on that, that we, they were able to have a conversation. It wasn't just the architect designer that did the magic wave of the hand and said, this is my way. Richard was open to having full conversations and dialogues about Perfect. how it's not only going to be an idea, but it's going to work. Alan, how do we get in touch with you? Alan Kurtz is BAK at GothamHallEvents.com or BAK at ZigfeldBallroom.com either way. And uh, I think I'm available on Google as well. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you to everybody for uh, discussing ballrooms. Probably the only place on the podcast world that ballrooms are taking up this much time. Thank you. All right, we're back in the studio now. David, uh, you're in ballrooms for events all the time, as am I. Uh, and you've also thought about venue design. What's what's your biggest takeaway for venue owners or operators uh, and for planners? I, th I, I do believe that the details in a ballroom really matter. Mm -hmm. And that depending on, I think we talked a lot about the personality of the ballroom. And that 
you sit there and you look around. And when you look around and you're kind of delighted by what you see, that's all part of the experience. So it is one big experience that people have to realize. And a designer, an event designer, who comes in and transforms a ballroom has an even bigger task because they are really trying to take this canvas and turn it into something else that someone else already has figured out what the canvas is. The, the you know That's why we may be moving at some point to a white box situation in some ballrooms. It is an interesting choice that everybody has to make. If you're if you're redesigning your ballroom, you're creating one from scratch. It's it's do you have that white box or do you want it to look nice when somebody tours it? You know, can do you have to set the stage a little to convince some clients, or do you do you not want to do that? Yeah, it's, no, I think it, there is a, a little bit of conundrum in terms of you know how you start. What, what do you what is your the first thing you put on the page? Right. Because does a ballroom get dated quickly or not? Mm-hmm. Yes. Carpeting is another thing. You know, you look at especially some of the Las Vegas ballrooms, they have the most loud, crazy carpeting. And, yeah. um, and then others, it's this muted gray elsewhere. And, and um, I think it, it right off the bat, you're setting the tone for what your space looks like. And um, yeah, it's interesting. So in your opinion, what's what's one must have for ballrooms? What does every ballroom have to have? That's I didn't. Uh, let me think about that one. Um, I think that a ballroom has to have grandeur. You know, it ha- if it's going to be a ballroom, it has to be a ballroom. Mm-hmm. Um, I was noticing the ball, the my favorite ballroom I ever saw on television, actually, was when uh, Donald Trump went to Saudi Arabia and the ballroom was so over the top that it was like I was staring at it for hours. And it was... Um, it was it was incredible on how much how ornate it was and how much detail there was and and it was what I think of a ballroom a ballroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate. You know, you're watching an event on TV or watching something on TV, and, and your eye is drawn to the details of the the space. And, or you know, you event know, planners, and event organizers exactly. are looking at everything other than what they're supposed to look at. Right. Exactly. Great. So, so Beth, what's going on with BizBash this week? Well, since this is a venue conversation, uh, let's give a quick plug for our venue coverage in BizBash. We just published this year's BizBash Best, which is an annual guide to the best new and renovated venues in 17 cities, plus a special edition that focuses on downtown Los Angeles. And our subscribers should have either received that in their mailbox or their email inbox. One of the one of the two, because it's both print and digital. And if you didn't, you can find that on our website. Uh, and we also published our local. Uh, Location scouts online, and those are quick hits, 10 new venues in each um, of the cities that we cover. And you can also find those on our site. Uh, and combining new and the old is the venue directory on bizbash.com. So, you know, you search for what you're looking for, the city, the venue type, size, et cetera, and then get a list tailored tailored to your needs. Do you know what I'm hearing people are doing? They're, they're sitting in their conference room, and they got to make this decision on a, on a venue. So it becomes the ultimate brainstorming tool. So they're going and getting feedback from maybe, what about this? Or what about that? Oh, I didn't know about this. Oh, I heard about this and I remember going to something like that and it's and, and it becomes a uh, BizBash becomes a living breathing brainstorming tool especially in committee atmospheres and you get to experience it uh, and it and it's very simple we try to minimize your decision making process on this so that you can go further and if you are interested go deeper into the venue Absolutely. So a lot of tools for your, lot of tools. your use there and uh, we hope you you do put them to good use. Yes. So until next week, gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. If you are looking for a state-of-the-art learning management system, take a look at Digitel's newest platform, Opus DX. Opus DX offers the robust platform for event organizers and associations to manage content. To learn more and schedule a demo, email them at contactus at digitelinc.com. That's contact us at D I G I T E L L I N C dot com. This episode is also sponsored by Event Leadership Institute. Invest in yourself and your staff with self paced online event education designed to fit into your busy schedule. Subscribe to the Event Leadership Institute for only $25 per month and gain access to an extensive on demand video library of classes 
as well as interviews with industry leaders. Best of all, you can watch classes in small pieces or all at once. For more information, visit eventleadershipinstitute.com.